Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Bible study on 1 Peter, uh, which will be the last of our classes on 1 Peter. Coming to you today from beautiful, uh, sunny Manitowoc, Wisconsin, uh, on a little bit of a church history research trip and also keeping an eye on those four little angels for a couple of days. But we can take care of business uh, with this last section of this wonderful uh, little book, First Peter. I think that uh, all the usual preliminaries still apply. Uh, in a minute here, we'll get the screen shared uh, for you so you can follow along with that. Uh, there will be the usual handout uh, with the very same outline that's on the screen uh, in case you want to get a hard copy or use that. I will attach it as I always do to the email that goes out and also it should be attached uh, if you watch this class uh, off our church's website. Okay, so uh, I think we are, are ready to go. I think you will uh, see today that uh, when we look at our verses from First Peter, uh, it's not going to be uh, a whole lot of new, dramatically different uh, information that we're going to have. Uh, there'll be a few little extra tidbits and uh, just a, a few different angles on some of the same things with some different word pictures. Uh, but for the most part, uh, all the key things that uh, we want to put in our survival kit uh, for being a believer in an unbelieving world has already been said. But if it is true, which it is, that repetition is the mother of learning, uh, then there's always going to be benefit for us uh, to go back and, and touch on a few things that, that are important to us. Uh, all right, so having said that, let's, let's get started. Oh, maybe I should just say too, if, if Peter, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit, uh, felt that it was worth repeating some of these things, who am I to quibble with that, right? Our opening prayer today. Lord God, in the midst of struggling, trials, and persecution, keep our hearts and minds stayed on you, our only refuge. Amen. I like that word, stayed. That's um, not a, a word or a verb form that is all that uh, familiar anymore and in the way people talk, but uh, I like the way it sounds. Keep our hearts and minds stayed on you, uh, focused, zeroed in, uh, dependent on, and and, and everything else. Uh, good word. All right, first things. Uh, first of all, I have an attachment for you. Uh, don't read too much into that statement. That simply means that uh, I have an attachment for you. Uh, I will attach it uh, to the email that I sent out. Uh, I can also, I think, send it along for the uh, the video uh, portion of the church's website. It's just uh, one of those things that that I get or I read or I run across and um, I like it. It seems meaningful to me. And so uh, I'm going to share it with you. Simple as that. Whoop, hold on here. Had a little bit of a glitch. Hang on. There we go. And the, the second thing uh, on our first things today is, uh, as I've already mentioned, we're going to finish up uh, Peter's first letter today. And then uh, right at the end, just kind of summarize some things. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, uh, but just give you a, a few things to kind of tie everything up and 
and to, to remind each other of what we've put into our, our survival kit. Okay, we are in chapter five and the first chunk of the chapter that we're going to uh, read the first four verses, uh, which has an admonition for the elders. Uh, that's the little paragraph uh, summary that is in uh, my Bible that I'm using to uh, copy for you here. And I think that pretty well uh, sums up what's here. But, and yet it's, it, there's a lot more than that obviously, as we're gonna talk about. Uh, the elders were uh, Peter's target audience here, so to speak, but certainly not just them. And we begin as we have gotten used to beginning with a therefore, a therefore as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and as one who also shares in the glory that is about to be revealed, I appeal to the elders among you. Yeah, therefore, yet again, huh? Uh, just remembers that it ties us into what has gone on before and, and, uh, and continues a, a thought or continues, in, in this case, a summary of some thoughts uh, but I think what follows there uh, is, is worth uh, a few minutes of our time. Uh, another one of my word pileups, as I've been calling them, uh, as we've been doing this, uh, as Peter is talking about himself. And look at the way uh, he describes himself uh, uh, as a fellow elder. A, a witness of the sufferings of Christ. That's one of the characteristics of, of the apostles. Uh, they were to be eyewitnesses uh, of the life and ministry, the suffering and death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, and Peter is saying, uh, as uh, a fellow elder with you, uh, I'm not just the big cheese, uh, the apostle, and, and you better uh, heal to me. No, we're, we're in this together, uh, a fellow elder. Uh, but then uh, that reference to his apostleship, uh, that, that he is uh, one of those uh, sent out by Christ, those eyewitnesses. And the, the third part of the triad there, as one who shares. Uh, another, hey, everybody, and not just my fellow elders, but, but all of us together, we all share. And, and that's one of the things that really helps us uh, as far as uh, coping as a believer in, a, in an unbelieving world is, is that we are not alone. We, we, we share our, our existence. We share our struggle. We share our hopes. Uh, we share the status that we have. And also, as it says here, we share in the glory that is about to be revealed. Uh, once again, as, as the, all the apostles do, and we've heard uh, Peter more than once in this little letter, uh, keeping our eyes on the prize. Uh, we are but strangers here, foreigners, aliens, all those different terms. Um, our, our real life and what we're living for is yet to be uh, revealed. Uh, and that's, of course, the last day and, and the glory that is about to be revealed. So often now, uh, as it was in the ministry and the life of Jesus, and so often in the, the lives of, of his followers, uh, the glory doesn't always come jumping out at you. Uh, the glory doesn't always whack you on the side of the head. Uh, and sometimes it just seems like the glory doesn't exist. Uh, but it's there. It's real. It's hidden behind the cross for the here and now. Uh, but who we are, what we have, what we will be forever uh, will be revealed in all of its fullness and glory uh, when the Savior comes again. Doesn't mean we don't have anything for now. Uh, our emphasis on and our hope in and our holding on to what is about to be revealed doesn't mean that 
that we've got nothing now. It's not just pie in the sky when you die. Uh, knowing that we have that, that's been one of the keys of this whole letter. Knowing who we are and knowing what we have down the road is what gives us what we need uh, for the here and now. Uh, like I said, a lot of repetition in these verses too. But now, uh, Peter's specific target audience, those elders among them, those spiritual leaders and guides. Uh, we might say today uh, to my fellow pastors out there, to my fellow church leaders, uh, which is why words like this uh, always hit a little closer to home, uh, to those who are privileged. Uh, and I mean that when I say privileged, uh, to, to hold the, the office of uh, Herr Pastor, uh, the pastor, the shepherd, the elder. Uh, yeah, that's an honor, that's a privilege, uh, but it's a tremendous responsibility. And it brings with it uh, lots of stuff. Uh, and so here Peter is, is talking specifically to those spiritual leaders and elders. And why not, right? Who, who do we want to turn to uh, when we, we are struggling or having a difficult time as, as a believer in an unbelieving world? Well, we, we want to go to our spiritual leaders, uh, our, our, our spiritual guide, our pastor, uh, so that he can share uh, the precious truths of God's word so he can help us to make use of that survival kit uh, that God has given us in his word. All right, then verse two, keeping that target audience in mind, but also, as I said in the bulletin, just because you're not one of them doesn't mean that now you can uh, check out of this part of the study and uh, make a run to the bathroom or uh, go to the refrigerator or get another cup of coffee or whatever. No, don't check out here. Uh, look for what, what Peter is saying to the elders. What is there that you can pull out uh, for you. Uh, Peter says, shepherd, taking the noun, turning it into a verb, shepherd God's flock. And remember that, God's flock. Uh, uh, any pastor, every pastor needs to be reminded, uh, this is not your flock. And I know we, we talk that way, but you have to understand, uh, hopefully, what we mean by that when we say, uh, oh, uh, I, I'm doing a Bible class for uh, my congregation, a pastor might say. Or someone may ask, what congregation is yours? Well, it's not really ours, it's God's flock. And, and that's half the battle uh, of, of serving as one of God's under shepherds, as one of those elders, is to realize that you have been entrusted with something that doesn't belong to you. Uh, this is God's flock. Uh, I'll maybe just share this with you, and, and maybe you think this is kind of corny or a bunch of baloney. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I know it's true because I felt it. Uh, literally, uh, the, the day after my installation and ordination, and my brother, uh, who was there, who preached for my uh, my ordination and installation was still there, and 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 I think he helped me uh, to to think about this. It was like all of a sudden, uh, all of the excitement and all of the enthusiasm and all of the uh, all the fun stuff that goes along with uh, finally being a pastor and and having a wonderful installation ordination service and. A lot of people and friends and relatives were there, and all that was all that was done. You know, the, the pot roast was gone, uh, the relatives were on their way home, and everybody else was back to their life as per normal. And that's when it dawned on me. And and I kid you not, it was literally almost something that I felt uh, being put on my shoulders. I'm going, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah, you're a pastor. That means all those people that you saw yesterday, that's your flock. 
but it's not your flock, it's God's flock. That was still pretty neat and pretty exciting, but it was also a really big reality check and a reminder of the responsibility uh, that the elders have for, for God's uh, flock. And, and of course it says, don't worry about the flock that hasn't been given to you, the flock that is among you. Uh, you take care of your own 40 acres. Uh, that's your job to shepherd that flock uh, among you. Serving as overseers. That's, I, I know there's a word for that kind of a, of a word, uh, which the definition of the word is in the actual word itself. Overseer. Uh, shepherd has a whole connotation and picture in itself. Uh, pastor, uh, which is just another uh, word for a shepherd. Overseer. You are overseeing uh, something that has been entrusted to your care. Not grudgingly, but willingly. Uh, yeah. I was going to say something there, but maybe it doesn't matter. Well, well, living in an unbelieving, uh, hostile society, that does affect all of God's people, whether it's the shepherd or the flock, and, and we're going to be affected by that. And, and so sometimes having the responsibility of an elder uh, maybe isn't always going to be easy. Uh, and sometimes the challenges and, and the work uh, can be grudging. And uh, there, there's the temptation there uh, to think that this is something that, uh, that we, we have to do. Uh, and if I didn't have to do it, I wouldn't do it. Uh, not grudgingly, but willingly. Uh, because you're keeping in mind who we're talking about here and what's at stake as God desires, not because you are greedy for money, but because you are eager to do it. Um, yeah, I think that speaks for itself. Eagerness. I could say something about the, uh, I, I don't know of too many uh, elders who are eldering or pastors who are pastoring or shepherds who are shepherding uh, because they're in it for the money. Uh, doesn't mean that that can't happen. Doesn't mean that that doesn't happen. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, we could come up with some examples of that. Uh, but the idea here is that you are, you are doing it for the sake of Christ. You are doing it because this is the calling that God has given to you. Uh, you are doing this because there's souls at stake. And, and uh, yeah, verse three, do not lord it over those entrusted to your care, but be examples for the flock. Now that's something that, uh, that hits a little closer to home too. It's, uh, and, and Jesus' first disciples had to deal with this, um, that their disciples, they're the Lord's. Uh, you're the pastor. Uh, in the sense of that makes you the Lord of the manor. No, do not lord it over them. Uh, Monday, Thursday, upper room, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, that was the whole point. Uh, servants, you are all foot washers, uh, and that's what God's uh, elders are, servants. And there's that phrase again, entrusted to your care, entrusted. Oh, the Holy Spirit just picks wonderful words, doesn't he? Uh, this flock has been entrusted to you, to your care. It's one of the things I, I told you, and I think in the first class of this is one of the reasons that, that I think First Peter has always stuck out for me. And I'm sure it's true in other parts of the Bible too. 
Uh, but for whatever reason, this little epistle, it just seems like in every word or every phrase, there's just so many layers of wonderful things uh, for us to, to find there. Be examples uh, for the flock. Yeah. And verse four points us to the prize again. When the chief shepherd appears, second coming of Jesus, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. Uh, this is not cause and effect in the sense that if if we are if you are a good elder, then you will have earned this this crown of glory at the end. No, uh, but when when the under shepherds carry on faithfully uh, the the work of of shepherding the flock, everybody wins. Uh, and when the chief uh, shepherd appears on the last day, uh, we will together. Shepherd and flock uh, get to wear the crown, the crown of glory. We sing, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. Uh, yeah, he is worthy uh, to wear the crown, uh, but he shares the crown uh, with us too. Yeah, okay, what a bullet, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another, another. We've we've been kind of looking at the different ways Peter uh, names describes Jesus, and here's another one: the chief shepherd. Another mouthful uh, description of the Savior, uh, and I always uh, like to keep in mind, you know, the second commandment. And when we talk about the second commandment about keeping God's name holy, uh, part one of that catechism lesson on the second commandment is what is God's name? Well, yeah, it's all those titles that we use uh, to, uh, to call upon him and by which we can know him. But God's name is also everything that he has revealed to us about himself. And so many of the names of Jesus describe uh, what he does on our behalf. And chief shepherd certainly uh, is one of them. We will receive that unfading crown of glory. That calls for a yes, huh? Uh, and how's that for some survival help and assurance? We get everything we need now, and we get all the more when the chief shepherd appears. All right, verses one to four. Read them over again. Think about them. Let them sink in. And just about everything that that God says to his elders, specifically to them, uh, there is plenty in there for all of us uh, to take out uh, for ourselves um, and applying it uh, personally. I would think so anyway. Yeah, here's a, another study note from the Evangelical Heritage Version Study Bible, giving you a couple more uh, sneak peeks of that uh, reference that maybe someday you'll be able to hold in your hands. Uh, Peter describes the activity of an elder in verse 1 and an overseer as that of a shepherd who's caring for God's flock. In Hebrews 13, 17, this activity is described as keeping watch over souls, overseeing, overwatch. A shepherd did two important things, a, a real shepherd. He led God's flock to green pastures and quiet waters, familiar words of Psalm 23, and he protected the sheep from the wolves. That's in John 10, the good shepherd chapter. So you got the shepherd Psalm and the, the, the shepherd chapter. A spiritual shepherd, and that can be all of us. That's what I was kind of getting at before. Uh, in one degree, one way or another, but uh, certainly to the elders, but not just. A, a spiritual shepherd does two things for the members of God's flock. He feeds them with God's word, the bread and water of life, and he protects them from false teachers. Pastor is the Latin word for shepherd. I can't help but to think on that that second part of that sentence that uh, a spiritual shepherd protects from false teachers. 
And uh, I'm sorry, but all too often that's in spite of what the sheep want. In fact, usually uh, when sheep wander, in fact, when sheep even leave the flock and say, I, I'm not gonna be part of this flock anymore, or I'm not gonna come anymore, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if very often that's because uh, the shepherd uh, had to protect them and protect them from something that uh, they didn't want to be protected from or didn't know that they needed to be protected from. Uh, and so the sheep get angry. Uh, remember, that's, that's what a shepherd does. Yes, when he feeds the flock, it, it's not just uh, what you want and when you want it. It also means he has to feed the flock when it comes time to protecting them from those things that uh, can do spiritual harm. Uh, yeah. Just a thought. 5 to 11, final exhortation. We're going to go back to the S word. And another likewise. Well, maybe we should do that just real quick. Let's look at the bullet points. Uh, another likewise before the S word again. And who is it this time? And, and what does this mean? Uh, really, in practical, everyday terms, what does this mean? Uh, we're going to try to think about that. And don't miss the all of you part of it. There's going to be a lot of imperatives uh, in these verses. So enjoy these verbs uh, that are giving you a command or an imperative. And then Peter's going to slip in another key Bible doctrine for us again, uh, reminding us of the Bible's teaching of the old evil foe, uh, our adversary, the devil, the roaring lion. And then uh, 9b and 10, uh, another loaded uh, verse, I call it a lalapalooza. And we're going to end this section with uh, another beautiful doxology. All right, let's go back. Likewise, young men, be submissive. And remember all the things we said about that, that word, the S word. It's not a dirty word. It's okay to say the S word. Uh, submit, be submissive to those who are older. Uh, th that was always a given, to respect your elders and, uh, and submit to them. Uh, I, I wish I could say that that hasn't changed, uh, but I don't believe it. I believe it has changed. Uh, I believe that all too often there is very little uh, respect for the hoary head. Uh, and that's not a good thing. Uh, at the same time, uh, being older doesn't necessarily mean that you can command uh, respect and obedience. Uh, it means that sometimes uh, you have to yield. Sometimes being older and wiser means you know when to say, uh, I am going to yield to the younger person. I am going to yield to, uh, to someone else in this situation. Um, the young men are not to submit to the elders just because they're, they're older, uh, but because of, of the experience uh, and the wisdom and sometimes just the respect that is due them uh, because, hey, they've, they've fought they've fought the battles already. Yeah. Always a good thing. One of those basic principles that don't go out of style, but having a proper understanding of it. So young men submit to those who are older. You just might learn something and just maybe by sub by submitting to the, your, your, your elders, uh, you can teach them a few things too. And uh, everybody wins again. But all of you, not just one particular group again, all of you, clothe yourselves. There's one of those, those uh, picturesque 
uh, imperatives. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Talk about uh, <laughs> one of the reasons why it's hard being a believer in an unbelieving world is because it's so countercultural. Where do you ever hear anymore uh, that, he, that the, the humble win? Uh, you're, you're supposed to be out front and out loud and nobody's going to give it to you, so you better be first in line taking it. I, yeah. Clothe yourselves with humility. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And you put all of this, too, in, in the context of, of what we're talking about here, especially when it comes to our, our, our relationship toward God uh, and, and, and the life that we live here and now as strangers waiting for uh, our, our Savior to, to come again. Uh, put it in that context, too. Uh, and that's why he goes on to say in verse 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under God's powerful hand, so that he may lift you up at the appointed time. Uh, especially when, when, when struggling, when trials, when tribulations, when being a child of God is tough, when, when the glory is hard to see, uh, that's when it becomes a real challenge to submit uh, to the powerful hand of God. Because... We always think there's a better way, and there should be a better way, and uh, we, we shouldn't have to suffer this. We shouldn't have to endure this. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll take matters into our own hand, and, and, and instead of starting out with saying, this is what God tells me, we, we say things like, well, this is what I think, or this is what I feel, or this is what I want, instead of thus says the Lord, uh, so that he may lift you up at the appointed time. God's work, God's way, God's time. Yeah. And it's in this context that we find a very, very familiar verse. Uh, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Uh, that's a great verse, even if it's standing all by itself. You put that verse uh, in this context of this chapter and of 1 Peter, and I think it becomes even more meaningful, uh, especially when it's a struggle as a believer in an unbelieving world. Cast all your anxiety on him. He does care for you. Some more imperatives. Have sound judgment. Be alert. Takes us back to the, the gird your loins and be sober. Uh, but now Peter gives us another reason for uh, the need for our alertness and our sound judgment. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around. Talk about a word picture. Like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Wow. Um, we, we teach about the angels, the fallen angels, and the chief of the fallen angels. The Bible doesn't talk a lot about them. God does not tell us everything we'd want to know about them. He tells us everything we need to know, to use that, uh, that off-use uh, cliche. And uh, what you need to know about the devil is he's not your friend. What you need to know about the devil is that uh, even though it sounds good, it's not. Uh, he's your adversary, not your buddy. Uh, the devil's not fun. Uh, the devil is not uh, a cutesy uh, video game. Um, the devil is not just some make-believe character uh, in a fantasy novel or a children's book. The devil is your adversary. 
Uh, he's like a deadly prowling lion and he's out looking for, for someone to devour. He doesn't want to play with you. He doesn't want to help you. He wants to devour you. Uh, I've had people say to me, oh, come on, pastor. Uh, let's not make a big, big deal about it. Uh, we're just kidding. Well, I'm sorry. Jesus isn't kidding. He, he, he's saying, be alert. Look at verse 9. Resist him. How do you resist him? By playing games with him? By assuming that you can handle him? No, by being firm in the faith. And, uh, and this is one of the places where uh, having fellow believers can be reassuring. You know that the same kinds of sufferings are being laid on your brotherhood all over the world. Yeah, when we've used the expression, at least I've used the expression, uh, sometimes the living like a Christian in this world is like having to swim against the current upstream. And that's hard. Um, but it's much more doable when we can look around and see uh, other fish uh, and also swimming upstream with us. And then verse 10, after you have suffered a little while. And that's the way God describes this life. And, and sometimes it, it doesn't seem like it. Uh, it seems like it's the long, long, hard march. Um, but he says it's just a little while, the suffering, especially compared with eternity. After you've suffered a little while, and that's another of the, of the comforts here. Not only are we uh, alone, uh, this is not, there's an end to this. Uh, we don't always see the end, but God does. He's been to the end. He finished it. Uh, a little while, the God of all grace who called you into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. There's my Lollapalooza verse. Just love this. Um, after the one who called you to his glory, how? In Christ Jesus. And then this pile up. He will restore, establish, strengthen, support. Yeah, the restore has the idea of, of taking something that's old and battered and beaten and maybe not just a little bit broken and putting it all back together and making it look better than new. To establish, make it firm. It's not going anywhere. Strengthen, support. Yeah, no wonder Peter launches into another little doxology to him be the glory and the power forever and ever amen to that huh amen so really this this brings an end to the uh to the letter the message proper uh, and you can kind of see like we said um that uh, a lot of repetition of some of the same thoughts uh, but yet some of the same wonderful uh, word pictures uh, that help us uh, in our, our walk as children of God. And before he signs off, he gives these final words of, of encouragement and exhortation. Yeah, there are the, the bullet points again. See if we missed anything. Yeah. I think we got her. One more from the study Bible. When a person has suffered for a little while for being a Christian, uh, it may not seem like a little while. He or she might be tempted to give up. With four words, my Lollapalooza verse, restore, establish, strengthen, and support. Peter describes what God does to help such people. Like an artisan who fixes something that is broken, like a piece of furniture, 
he restores them. As an assurance of help encourages a heart that has wavered, God's word establishes their confidence again. As exercise improves muscles that have become weak, God strengthens them with the word. Like a house that is built on a rock so it can withstand the storms that blast against it, he puts a good foundation under them. Yeah, that paragraph says it a whole lot better than, than I did. Read that over again. That's, that's, that's worth, worth it. Finally, the greetings at the end. I have written to you briefly, talking to um, the early believers, through Silas, whom I consider a faithful brother. I have written to you briefly to encourage you and to testify that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, who, has cho who was chosen along with you, greets you. So does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, so some little tidbits of information here, three uh, proper nouns there, and maybe you, you know some of those. Silas was, was that um, missionary along with the Apostle Paul, uh, accompanied on some of those missionary journeys. Uh, uh, Peter knew him too, uh, obviously. Um, and uh, Silas doesn't get the same type of credit and billing as, as the apostles and the disciples, um, but yet we can tip our cap to him, this, this faithful elder, this faithful child of God, uh, this faithful companion and support for the apostles. Uh, and Peter says, a faithful brother. Uh, and any, any pastor will, will tell you how thankful he is for all the Silas's uh, of his life and his ministry and his congregation or wherever. Uh, someone that you can consider a faithful a brother and sister. And in this case, it's very possible too that uh, Silas is the one who actually uh, wrote this. Peter uh, wrote it, uh, but he dictated it and, and Silas uh, is the one who actually recorded it. Uh, and maybe it's uh, Silas's Greek that we're reading here and not Peter's uh, for all those who like to say that Peter couldn't have written this because this doesn't sound like the, the Greek of a Galilean fisherman, which is a bunch of baloney. Uh, but if you like baloney, uh, then at least you can say, well, Silas, it's his Greek. Uh, and he was no slouch. Uh, anyway, faithful brother and companion and helper here. Uh, Babylon. Babylon was that great Old Testament powerhouse uh, to the east of the, of the promised land, uh, Babylon uh, and King Nebuchadnezzar was that, that foreign pagan power that God used as his scourge of judgment on his rebellious, idolatrous, uh, immoral Old Testament people. He used the Babylonians to take them off into slavery. Uh, yeah, so the Babylonians uh, and Babylon were... were, were that, that, it was known as, as the enemy from the east, so to speak. Uh, and Babylon was, was one of the centers of the world, uh, the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, and of course, like any great uh, center of an empire then or now, meant that Babylon had a lot of garbage too, uh, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of ungodly, unspiritual things. Uh, and so Peter talks about she who is in Babylon. Well, he's not talking about the Babylon to the east. Uh, very often the city of Rome was referred to as Babylon, not only as uh, the, the heart and soul of, of the Roman Empire, uh, 
but also was going to be uh, come a center of the of the church, uh, Rome. And there also was a, a Christian congregation in Rome, and and Rome too was was known as a place where if you're looking for bad, you won't have any problem finding it in Rome. So to the church, the fellow believers who are in Babylon, chosen along with you, uh, greets you. So the fellow believers here are greeting and encouraging the fellow believers here. And this is also a part of what leads uh, Bible scholars to believe that uh, that Peter wrote this epistle uh, from Rome and possibly uh, before he was martyred uh, for the faith. And Mark also greets them. Uh, Mark uh, is a young man we meet in the Gospels. Uh, Mark was uh, probably a young, uh, very young, uh, maybe even a teenage, maybe even a youth uh, who was at the Garden of uh, Gethsemane and who fled that night uh, along with the others. Uh, many believe that Mark, uh, his family owned the, uh, the room where the, uh, the Monday Thursday events took place. Uh, Mark is not an apostle. He did become one of the evangelists, and he's the one who would have been the author of the Gospel of St. Mark, which many people often refer to also as the Gospel of Peter. That Mark, as the spiritual son, not physical son, but the spiritual son of, of Peter, uh, got his information, his influence, his inspiration for that gospel account uh, from his spiritual father, uh, Peter. Uh, and Mark was apparently with Peter. And so greetings from the evangelist uh, Mark as well. And then greet one another uh, with a kiss of love. We'll come to that in a minute. Why did Peter write this? Uh, let's not lose sight of the most important part here. I have written to you to do what? To encourage you. And that's what, why it's still here for you and me, for encouragement. But it's also there to reassure us and to, more than that, to testify. When you testify to something, you are saying, God be my witness. This is the true grace of God. Don't buy into all that other stuff as far as what you need to do and what's okay for you to do to get by and to get through as a believer in an unbelieving world. This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in that. And then peace to all of you. That, that greet one another with the kiss of love. Uh, and, and that was uh, kind of a, a cultural thing. You, you, you greet them with a kiss. I always used to kid around when, uh, when we talk about this in Bible class and, and, and the people would say, the, you know, the, greet them with the kiss of love. Is that something that uh, we want to initiate in our congregation, Pastor? Uh, and we think of all the, the silly, awkward moments uh, that that would bring on a Sunday morning. Um, and then uh, with the COVID police being as active as they are, uh, the kiss of love, the kiss of peace uh, would certainly be frowned upon. Uh, and so I'd always used to say, well, maybe we don't have to initiate the kiss of peace on Sunday morning. Maybe just a handshake will do. Uh, and now we even have to downgrade that uh, to an elbow bump or just a, a meaningful wave. Yeah, the kiss of peace. Peace, that's how Peter ended. That's how we'll end this particular uh, Bible study. Shalom lo, peace to you, peace be to you. Uh, as the Hebrews would say, Shalom Alechem. That's Aramaic. The everyday 
um, Hebrew, the Hebrew of the street, so to speak. Uh, peace to you. Irene Pazi, the language of the Greek, the international language of the day, uh, the epistle, the New Testament was written in Greek. Peace to all of you. The language of the church, Pax Wobiscom, peace be with you. And then finally, as everyone used to say uh, back in the day, peace. Uh, no matter what language, no matter how you spell it, uh, peace be to you. Uh, that peace which surpasses all understanding. Uh, those words that uh, a pastor will speak at the end of the sermon, and which I was always reminded uh, by fellow pastors and certainly at the seminary. seminary uh, when you say amen at the end of your sermon, before you're going to speak the words of peace, uh, don't just say words. Okay, talk from here. And uh, if you're going to have people stand up for the peace, then give them a chance to stand up and let it sink in and say, I've got something to send you home with here. Uh, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Means the same in whatever language. So peace be to you. Uh, as you let these words of this wonderful epistle uh, work for you. Told you we're going to do a, a quick summary, and it's going to be very quick. It's going to be lightning quick. Uh, so gird your loins. Uh, hang on. Here you go. What's in our survival kit? Know God. Know who your God is. And early on, we saw how he revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Always look for the ways that God is telling us something about who he is. And know your God. Um, and if you know your God, then you're not going to let uh, your, your problems get bigger than your God. And you're struggling. Know who you are. Think of all the wonderful pictures, uh, a chosen people, uh, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belong to God are just some of the ways God describes it and says, you think I don't know, you think I don't care, you think it doesn't matter to me what happens to you? What? No. Remember who we are, and you put that together with who he is, and uh, there's more than half of your uh, survival kit. Whoops. Whoops. Rejoice. Back in chapter one. Yes, even rejoice uh, in your suffering. Because remember, happiness and joy? Joy's in here. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, your Lord. Uh, that gives us joy. And so no matter what may be true, uh, we can always rejoice. Yeah, don't let your fears become bigger than your faith or bigger than your God. And that's so easy to do. And, and, it, and it's not to say that, that there's nothing to fear. It's not to say that what we have to be afraid of isn't big. Just don't let it get bigger uh, than your God-given faith uh, in your all-powerful God understand suffering and how God uses that. It's, it's not something that's telling you God forgot or doesn't care or doesn't know. Understand that suffering is a strengthening, a purifying, uh, and it's intended uh, for blessing. And sometimes suffering is the attention grabber. Uh, you've heard me refer to it as God's two by four. Uh, the only way he can get your attention sometimes is to whack you across the side of the head with his two by four uh, of suffering. And sometimes he lets these things happen. Sometimes he sends these things into our life uh, and uh, we'll use that suffering uh, for his purpose and his good. Yeah, understand suffering. Doesn't mean you have to go looking for it. Doesn't mean you have to say, oh, good, suffering but yet understand it. 
live holy lives. So we've talked throughout this is that uh, w- what God is giving us for our survival in an, in an unbelieving world, it's not necessarily changing everybody else and fixing everything else. It's talking about uh, taking care of us and fixing us and live holy lives. Um, don't jump into the swamp with them. Crave the word. Yeah, everything revolves around God's revelation of himself. That's where you see Jesus. Uh, that's where you see the truth. That's where you see the lessons about suffering. That's where you're going to find all of these survival kit tools. Uh, crave that pure spiritual milk of the word. And of course, that should say something about that there's never an excuse for being biblically illiterate. You are never going to be Bible knowledge full, but there's no excuse. And how foolish it is and what joy it brings to the devil for us to blow off God's word as if that's something that only the uh, the pastor needs to know. Um, If your Bible is a stranger to you, get reacquainted. And that's your roadmap that's going to get you home. And if you've got a roadmap that's going to get you home, you're going to make sure you know how to use a map. Crave the word. Be honorable in all that you do. Uh, We talked about that. Uh, It's part of the live a holy life. Be honorable. There's plenty of dishonor already. We don't need that from the children of God. You maybe will not get treated honorably. But you be honorable. Submit. Yeah, we've talked about that being a positive word. Line yourself up behind uh, things that are intended for your good. And that applies to those little individual uh, demographics we talked about. But finally, all of you, God's word says. No fear. We don't have to fear what they fear. Um, the fear of death, the fear of having to finally trying to always have to measure up and then knowing that you can't and don't. And so, yeah, the fear of living, the fear of dying. Don't fear what they fear. Remember who you are. Don't give them a reason. Uh, If you're going to suffer, remember, uh, let it, be suffering because you've done God's will. And that's going to be part of your always being ready to give a defense. Put that in your survival kit. Uh, keep on surprising them. Remember that? Peter told us that that the, the unbelieving world is going to be surprised that, that you don't want to wallow in the muck with them. Well, keep on surprising them. Be that example, that light, that salt that the gospels always tell us Uh, and love as we have been loved. Uh, Love is not a warm fuzzy. It's not a tickle down the spine. It's not just a word. It's not just an expression. Love you. No, uh, love is God given God sourced uh, to us. And then through us, uh, genuine, sometimes yielding, um, Yeah, love gives, uh, doesn't necessarily expect in return. Use your gifts and talents that God has given to you uh, and use them for his purposes. There's the gird your loins, the be sober, be alert, the stand firm. Yeah, then our closing prayer. There's a, that was a quick summary, but... You can do what I did. Just walk through the epistle and you'll find plenty of good stuff. Almighty God, keep us strong in faith through your word as we constantly behold your son who saves us from sin, death, and an unbelieving world. May we always rely on you that we may confidently believe in you and follow you. Amen. 
Amen. That's going to be it for a while. Sorry it took a while to, to get this one out to you, but now you have it. You've got all of First Peter. Uh, we're going to let it rest for a while, and we'll see if there is a desire uh, to have something else in the future, and uh, we'll let you know when that happens. Okay, that's it. Goodbye from Manitowoc. Bye from the youngins. And uh, now they're peeking around the corner, so I'll go see ya.